I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, I want to ask your help in solving a puzzle that I have been working on for a very long time. I feel like there's some missing piece that is buried in the couch cushions or in the shag carpet, and I want to run a couple different scenarios past you for what that could look like so at least we know what kind of puzzle piece we're looking for. This is the official narrative of World War II, and that's something that I know doesn't add up. I know that something is wrong with it. And I've talked about this in my episode on C.J. Hopkins and the New Normal Reich and also in Forgiving Hitler. The piece that is missing is how the Germans went from economic genocide with the Weimar inflation inflicted on them by the bankers who had determined that World War I would be fought with all borrowed money from them and that the emperor would not impose taxes for it. So they not only ended up paying all the reparations for that war, but also were paying back this debt. And together that had put them into circumstances that were genocidal. They went from that to a thriving economy that was not militaristic, that was not based on conquest, that was not all war amounts that were going back into the coffer. So how that happened is a piece of the puzzle. What I know, and anyone who's been doing this research and questioning that narrative, is that the fascist won. World War II. We know that Winston Churchill, representing the city of London with his statement that he wanted to prolong the war so that Germany and Russia would bleed each other dry, Churchill won that war. And we know that Truman, by dropping two completely unnecessary bombs that he wanted to try out on helpless cities in Japan stole that victory away from the Russians who had given the most in terms of lives and blood. So that's who won World War II. What I don't know for sure is who lost. Is it back to my original statement that all wars are empire versus sovereignty? Or is World War II the great exception? And did the good guys actually win and the bad guys lose? Or did the fascists play both sides of the chessboard against each other, even to the final step? That's what I want your help in answering. Let's do this. So here's scenario one for how Germany went from the genocidal Weimar inflation inflicted by the bankers to becoming an economic powerhouse where there was high employment, high levels of production, and a very high standard of living. And this was before the invasion of Poland. What I was doing recently was talking to Joe Atwill, who always gives me more pieces of the puzzle that I can then juggle. So the things that Joe was talking about was research into Madame Blavatsky, the founder of the theosophy religion, if you can call it that. And that rather than being a mild-mannered mystic, She was really a militant who then used her theosophy as a cover for things that involved a lot of uh, cavorting with very wealthy people and that she designed the swastika and that she also 
helped with the Aryan salute, which was also developed by the person who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance, because I do remember that from other research that originally the Nazi salute was what one did while reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, just to keep in mind. So in that scenario, there are the Freemasons, there is a global group of oligarchs that then are funding Hitler and reconstituting Germany. So you have bankers, and maybe it's the same ones, maybe it's not, that according to Joe, the Rothschilds were sent out of Germany and that J.P. Getty ended up getting all of their art collection, but that it continued to have connections with all of those bankers and that they were funding Hitler in secret and able to, I guess, reconstitute the entire German economy with the money that they were pouring into it. What concerns me about that scenario is if they were the same bankers, why would they do that? I mean, there's other labor pools around and that you don't really want to have a high standard of living for everyone if your objective is to get people working for cheap for you. So I just don't know. But it's definitely something that I think we should consider. And then there's the second scenario, which I've talked about before, and Ellen Brown talks about in Web of Debt. This is that when Hitler was in the military, he was assigned to spying on some socialist who had studied the American system. They had studied in the U.S., the system that William Jennings Bryan was trying to put into place of sovereign money, of money that you were producing yourself without borrowing from the bankers. And that when he became the Fuhrer, he put that system into place. And there are quotes from him that I have uh, cited before where he says, why, why would we borrow from the bankers? We have everything that we need. We have plenty of skilled labor. We have the resources, we have the producers, and we have the consumers. So why do we need the bankers? So that would be consistent with what we've heard about his system in terms of how that could have made Germany, if they had ousted the bankers, be able to go to this thriving economy. But I believe the bankers would not have taken that line down. That if he had ousted them and had done this other system, how would they get back at him? Now, when I use the word Hitler, I'm not sure that I'm talking about a historical figure that has not been mostly fictionalized. So let's look at this scenario and what that would mean. That this would be in line with everything that I've said about there being one war, which is empire against sovereignty. Germany at that point would have created a sovereign economy and perhaps that was crushed by the bankers. The narrative of this though has made it where that money system has now been associated with the universal face of evil. And it's been associated with anti-Semitism, which according to Joe Atwill was something that Madame Blavatsky brought in. And the whole idea of the Aryans, which was not a part of Germany prior to that. So, when Jack Sirius, for instance, talks about how in my book he learned how democracy became a fig leaf for empire and it was the anathematization <laughs> of anarchism, 
So anarchy, if that's the system of government that could get us out of empire, that became something associated with violence and chaos. And in the same way, when I talk about the story of Jesus being something that is a fig leaf for empire, the zealots who were completely against empire and were absolutely proactively, revolutionarily violent in their own defense, they became villainized and an insult to call anyone a zealot or an anarchist. In the same way, have we taken the economic system that could save us and have made it associated with the greatest evil that we've ever seen and a form of hatred that maybe was there and maybe wasn't until the fascists came in. So I'm not certain whether these are mutually exclusive. Could there be perhaps timing? Could it have been one group that put in this economic system and then another group who came in and developed all the things associated with the Nazi party and that have been collectivized by the one word Hitler and made it so that that is what we think of in association with sovereign money. What do you think? For more background on this, I can only point to C.J. Hopkins and the New Normal Reich and also Forgiving Hitler. Thank you for being part of this excavation uh, in history to find that missing puzzle piece in the couch cushions. <laughs>